here we are, the curlew. And um, for those of you who don't know it, and I can't believe down in Hampshire, you haven't seen or heard one probably at some time, particularly on the coast in the winter. But there you are, about the size of a mallard duck, I suppose, but with this extraordinarily beautiful long bill and um, that beautiful patterning of brown and gray and cream. Um, and uh, it's one of the, it, it's, it's big and it's noisy, but it also disappears as soon as you look at it. It's one of those extraordinary birds. Um, and we used to have so many of them. And as Keith said, we now don't. And so I'll, I'll just go through a little bit as to what the problems are. But first of all, it's a bird that has always incited poetic hearts. It really has. It's a bird of poetry. And even its name, Numenius Arquata, Numenius means new moon, and Arquata means shape of a bow. And so it's called the new moon bird with this bow-like beak, and which really does sum up how beautiful it looks. But it's not just, sorry, I'll go back. It's not just how it looks. It's not just its sculptural curvy form. It's very rounded and beautiful. It's how it sounds that really does inspire people. So just for a minute, I would like you just to sort of let this call of the curlew take you to places where, it, 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 where your soul wants to go in a way. So let the sound of the curlew uh, sort of ignite all those feelings we get when we hear this extraordinary call that it has. It really is an extraordinary sound. I think Amy Jane Beer just wrote a piece for The Guardian, I think it was, which said it was like a, a bubble that was just about to boil over. And uh, I can see exactly what she means. But it's inspired so many poets. W.S. Graham called it the Curlew's Love Weep, and Ted Hughes, a wobbling watercall, and Thomas Kinsella, a Curlew's lingering threadbare cry. W.B. Yeats wrote a whole poem called um, He Reproves the Curlew. And the first line is, O Curlew, cry no more to the air, or only to the waters in the west. And A.S. Bullen, who's a poet in, in South Wales, such trifling themes as life and death are kept in a curlew's call. And it's that idea that um, we don't know whether it's ecstatic or whether it's sad. It can be both. And in a way, the sound of the curlew's call mixes the major and minor keys. And we always associate major keys with something uplifting, minor keys with something melancholy. And somehow it mixes the two. So it's an extraordinary sound across our landscapes. So there it is, the new moon bird with its poetic and um, evocative call um, and rather very beautiful. And its range is right the way from the west, west of Ireland. It goes right the way across uh, to the east coast of Russia. Um, and it breeds mainly in those northern areas, right up in the north. Um, and then we'll spend the winter further south. So in the autumn and winter, loads and loads and loads of them come to us. We get uh, birds from us going to Ireland and we get Northern European birds coming to us, that making the most of our really mushy, wet and um, very mud, rich mud uh, outline and coasts. And that's when you're most likely to see them. Sorry about that. Most likely to see them in the winter. Uh, we get boosted up to a number of about 150,000. Um, in the winter months and so you particularly down where you are in the Solent will really be treated to a lot of birds in the winter, most of which will have come from Europe, most of which, but certainly there are some local birds mixed in there. But numbers are by no means uh, a guarantee, so we may get 150,000 birds coming in the winter, we may, the, the most recent estimate for England, for England, for curlews is 30,000, but that's no guarantee of success. That's a dramatic drop over the last 20 to 30 years. So let's look at its relative, the Eskimo curlew, once one of the most common birds in North America. 
in the 19th century. So common it made the sky go black, but two million were shot per year as they migrated from South America to Alaska to breed. Also their breeding grounds and their feeding grounds en route, uh, very importantly, were taken away. And the last one was seen in 1962 to photograph. And there was a, so far I think it was a confirmed sighting in 1963. There've been unconfirmed sightings of now and again since then, but for all intents and purposes is now considered extinct. So numbers cannot guarantee that we hold on to these birds and it's the rate of decline which we have to look at. And that's where you'll normally see them, um, a brown, gray and cream bird on a browny gray mud against browny gray water, if you're anything like me down in the southwest on the estuary. And many of them go to the wash, so it's the coasts where they spend the winter, but then they go inland. That's where they go to breed. Our British birds go to the uplands and always traditionally have gone to the uplands. So traditionally, right up until the middle of the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, most of the reports were only in the uplands. This is Yorkshire, and they nest up on these heather moorlands, rough grasslands, the sort of high ground of the northern belt of, of the high ground of England and into Scotland and Wales. And that's where we originally thought of them. But then something happened. Something happened in the middle to late 19th century and birds started to appear in the lowlands. It seemed like they kind of took off and they came down, they came down the hillside and they started to arrive in the lowlands. Nobody knows why really. Um, I couldn't really find out when I was traveling around, but I asked Ian Newton and he thought it was probably to do with the spread of grouse shooting in the north. Um, and, that, and that intensive management of upland areas made it very good for red grouse and for the people that shoot, shot them, but also very good for other ground nesting birds of which curlew benefited. So maybe, who knows, maybe the curlew did very well in this new place. All of its predators were taken away, it had nice places to nest and it moved down south. That's one theory, but as I stress, nobody actually knows. But when it did come down the hill, it found amazingly good feeding grounds. It found lovely flower rich meadows uh, that were the product of very slow, less intensive agriculture. It feeds on worms and insects. It just had a ball. It just loved it. And it would very quickly became a farmland bird. And it's amazing how quickly we've, had, we've adopted it and we've welcomed it into the sort of farmland bird coterie of animals. We just think it's always been there. It actually hasn't in the lowlands, as far as we know, for that long. John Clare never wrote about them. Um, and so it makes me think they probably weren't breeding in Northamptonshire when he was there. Um, and there aren't any breeding records in Norfolk till 1942. But come downhill it did and it has stayed and it had a great time and it settled in very quickly. And then we changed the goalposts. By the Second World War, we went from a slow little tractors, agricultural, slow agriculture, mixed agriculture, nuanced landscape to something much more intensive. Small farms became subsumed into big agribusinesses, whole areas of the lowlands were transformed um, and hedgerows were taken out. We know the scenario, you've heard it a hundred times. The lowlands became much more to do with uh, farming as a factory, as an intensive system, rather than lots of individual low input systems. And so changing fundamentally the character of our lowlands after the Second World War so, so that we could feed ourselves much more efficiently. We had such a scare when we nearly starved to death in the Second World War. And there we are. What was lots of higgledy-piggledy little old MacDonald farms has turned into great big monocultures, uh, much of which is cut for grass, for silage to feed cattle through the winter months. In the uplands, change was happening as well. Not only uh, shooting actually declined, in the Second World War, but what has changed is um, lots and lots of forestry. Sitka spruce plantations were put right the way through the uplands. Uh, a lot of the land drained and planted up. So the birds, and it's not just curlews, many other species as well, lost that upland habitat. Along with our intensive agricultural systems, uh, we 
have in seen quite a dramatic increase in these very clever and adaptable uh, um, generalist predators. Foxes and crows in particular, and badgers since stopping their persecution have done really, really well. And we have the densest population of crows, second densest population of, badger, of, of foxes in Europe. They, like, they, they nest in the trees, they like the landscape, they found new sources of food, they're doing really well. And so uh, curlews already under stress found more predators that would eat them. And so predation and land use, the two things which have seen it for the curlews in particularly in the lowlands. Um, and the populations are under immense stress as well as sheep. And I think uh, Chris highlighted this on a spring watch once. The sheep have been filmed uh, coming along and they actually push curlews off their nest and eat the eggs, which is a really interesting piece of sheep behavior, probably looking for the calcium, I should think and is surprisingly more common than people thought. And it's only since nest cameras have been going up have we seen this happening more and more. So the poor, poor old curlew, even with its long stabby bill, couldn't stop this sheep uh, from eating its eggs. Um, this is uh, Shropshire. They looked at what was the cause of the nest failure um, at, at the egg stage. And you can see foxes, uh, half of it really, with sheep doing quite quite a lot and they don't just eat it they also trample on the nests if we can't keep them away some crows some badger and other things uh, that's at the egg stage once the eggs hatch if they hatch if they hatch not only do they face predation but they can also get run over by tractors so they are sort of battling against many 21st century problems i think so this is BTO data. We've lost half of our breeding curlews in 20 years. That's 119,000 birds a year. That's about five and a half, sorry, 119,000 birds, five and a half thousand a year. And in 2015, the, uh, a paper came out in British Birds saying that the U Eurasian curlew could be considered the most pressing bird conservation priority in the UK. And coming out, I think in June, British Birds is running the follow-up five years after that publication, six years after that publication, where are we now? So that will be coming out very soon. But you can see from the BTO graph just how serious you can see from the map, the losses. Look, just look at what's happening in Ireland. Just look at Wales, just look at the uplands. And uh, the, the hidden story is the, um, is the sort of the area, if you can imagine where Birmingham is and draw a line south of that in England, the catastrophic losses that have been going on there. So relative breeding abundance changes between 1988 and 2008. I'll just let that sink in. That is quite dramatic to see that. No losses throughout the UK um, and in Southern Ireland. So uh, Keith mentioned earlier that Southern Ireland in the 1980s was known to have at least, and I say at least, 5,000 breeding pairs. That was only in the 1980s. The last count was 135. 5,000 to 135 since the 1980s. Northern Ireland has gone down. They are, they're lucky enough to have the RSPB looking after them in Northern Ireland in very constrained kind of environments on islands and reserves that the RSPB look after. So they're faring slightly better. So the whole of Southern Ireland has 135, the whole of Northern Ireland has probably around 200. Um, Wales, probably no more now than 400 breeding pairs. And talking to Natural Resources Wales, I was told the other day that they expect, now hold on to your hats for this, expect curlew to be extinct as a breeding bird in Wales within 10 years, if present declines continue. It's almost too hard to say. And southern England, we've seen, as I said, this dramatic decline. We think now there's around about 400 breeding pairs. If you draw that line from right across Birmingham and go south of that, about 400 pairs, which still leaves the uplands as the stronghold for curlews. But their range, their range is very important. And the range in, right down into southern England um, is under tremendous stress. So there we are, poor old curlew is not doing well. 
And lots of people say, and, and I, I get a lot of messages onto it, well, I don't see that that what's a problem. Every year I see them, there's lots around, I can hear them calling. But curlews live a long time. They can live to 32 years, the oldest one that's been found, um, probably commonly into their 20s. So they're going to keep coming back and they're going to keep trying to breed. Uh, they're just not getting any chicks away. So they are long lived birds. Adult survival is excellent, 90%. Once they've passed two years, they, they survive really, really well. It's the productivity, which is the problem. So after the British Bird Survey in 2015, uh, their paper, I decided I would try to find out what was going on with them. So I set off to go and start a 500 mile walk from the west coast of Ireland, through Ireland, through Wales, through England, and try to get to the heart of what was happening. It was so hard to understand what was going on at that point. And I decided the first day of my walk would be April the 21st. And I chose that because it's, it's put down as the average laying date in spring for curlews. So that was quite a good day, but also it's the feast day of this rather handsome little chap in a boat here from this painting. Um, this is um, the very well known, I'm sure you all know he is, St. Baino. And St. Baino is a sixth century abbot from west of Wales, who is quite famous for spreading Christianity throughout Wales. And he was sailing off the coast of Wales, legend tells us, and he dropped his book of sermons into the sea. And legend says that a curlew flew out from the shore, picked up his prayer book and took it to the shore to dry. And Baino was so grateful, he blessed the curlew and said, may you be forever protected. So I thought, well, his feast day is April the 21st by coincidence. So time to ask St. Baino for a bit of a refresh on that blessing. So that's why I chose April the 21st as the first day of the walk. And that was the route I took. Um, started off really in Northern Ireland where one of the, the strongholds still is, an RSPB reserve there. Uh, went down to the South, walked through the center of Ireland and then hopped over and did a little wiggle, but ended up on the east coast of, e of England about six, seven weeks later. In Ireland, that horrific crash in numbers became very obvious as you walk through Central Ireland. One of the things that was very obvious to me at the time was walking through what was once extensive raised bog. Um, bog that, it's not the blanket bog that you get on hillsides mainly, this is a naturally occurring accretion of dead matter and these big wet bogs in the centre of Ireland. And the centre of Ireland used to be one, basically one big raised bog. Much of it now taken over for agriculture, uh, although the birds still did very well up till recently in that agriculture, but masses of it, masses of it taken for, um, to feed for peat fired fuel stations, these um, big, big uh, energy generating stations fed by peat. Borden Amona, which owns those fire, those stations have said now they're stopping uh, using peat, but uh, you know, 99% of the raised bog has gone. The agriculture in Ireland was right up until the 1970s, very slow paced, as we said before, it was one of the last places to sort of switch to becoming more intensive, but more intensive it did from the 1970s um, with the common agricultural policy and then with the Celtic tiger. And it's really transformed the center of Ireland. And dairy now, dairy industry is just massive in Ireland. But wherever I went, wherever I walked, it was silage cutting to feed the dairy industry and the meat industry. Silage cut from as, as early as late April, early May onwards, often four or five times a year in some places. Massive ag, ag, afforestation of places, which is only set to increase. Uh, huge amounts of drainage of once wet, boggy lands, which curlews, lapwings, and all sorts of other birds like. And of course, the spraying of insecticide and pesticide and so on, which can affect their feeding. So the curly walk, as I ended up calling it, uplands, lowlands, intensive farmland, um, the heart of England, the coastlines, and ended up in East Anglia. And I really did felt I began to get a handle on what was happening to these birds and why it was such a dramatic decline. So straight away, I organised four national curlew conferences Top left in Ireland was the first one. I got back in about June 2016. By November, 
we'd organized the first national island conference. Then there was the Southern England one down held at Slimbridge, then a Welsh one bottom right, and then a Scottish one uh, just in 2019. And I started World Curlew Day you know, on April the 21st. And World Curlew Day is now entering its fourth year and um, loads of good things starting to happen. Um, and it gives people a nice focus. For those of us who don't live near curlews and feel we can't do much to help, and I'm one of those, um, World Curlew Day gives you a focus to, that you can do some fundraising or give a talk or whatever you like to do. Um, but it's a really important day to remember our curlew and other curlews around the world because Numenius is a, a group under serious pressure everywhere. Prince Charles also decided that he liked curlews. Well, he decided he does love curlews. And he held two of his own symposia, one on a, in a hotel in Dartmoor. Uh, and then he followed up later with one in Highgrove last year. And out of the back of that, he urged a group of organizations to get together. So it wasn't me that started the Curlew Recovery Partnership. It was actually something that came out of the Curlew, Highgrove Curlew Summit. Um, and nine organizations now sit around uh, a table as the steering group of the Curlew Recovery Partnership. And the Curlew Recovery Partnership, the steering group is literally just the central hub and is spreading out its net network much, much wider. It only started a month ago, so we're just getting ourselves together. And um, I happen to be chair. I refused to apply for chair. Then I was persuaded to apply for it. I then withdrew my application for chair. And when we had the meeting to appoint the chair, by the end of that meeting, I was chair. So <laughs> there seemed to be no escape from that one. But so far, it's a very interesting experience and it's gonna be a very challenging experience. But um, good people sitting around the table determined to do what it takes, uh, hopefully. So there we are, the Curly Recovery Partnership is the latest DEFRA funded, um, organization. We also had meetings in Downing Street uh, where we brought together politicians and conservation and scientists to try to hammer out what we could do about policy as well. So there we are, the Curly Recovery, <coughs> excuse me, partnership with all those organizations uh, sitting around in, as, as the central hub. So there we are, that's a brief overview of where we've got to. So getting What's happening to get these poor little chicks to actually fledge into adult birds? And I'll do a very quick run through of the sorts of stuff that's happening. The RSPB are running the Curlew Trial Management Project. Actually, it thinks this is just coming to an end where they've been uh, monitoring six upland only, only in the uplands sites, um, and looking at a trial plot and then an active plot. On the active plot, they've been doing some habitat management, uh, that specified towards curlews, if predator control if it's needed. In the in the uh, the other plot, they're just monitoring very similar area and size and numbers of birds, and to see if actual active management is making a difference. We haven't had any results from that yet, but six six years in, so hopefully we'll get that soon. But the curlews in the uplands, of course, face massive issues, um, and they find themselves right in the middle of some of the bitterest conflicts in conservation. And I really don't want to go into this in too much detail, but just to say that the upland management of curlews is something that's very much on everyone's agenda. And it is a very difficult and desperately contentious area to get into. In the lowlands, they have lots and lots of problems, but they do have uh, meadows, which we can still look after. And when birds are nesting in these meadows, we can put up things like electric fences. Um, and this is one example of a very intensively managed lowland farmland. You can see all the silage. You can see the lots of forests and trees around which. So there's lots of predators, lots of farming activity going on here, but there is a protected curlew nest. And there it is. It's got an electric fence around it and a curlew's nesting in the middle of it. But to show you how bad that is. So this bird was protected. It, it hatched out four lovely chicks and within two weeks, every single one of them had been killed. So once they, they hatch, they go outside of the, the, of the electric fence and then they just really don't get much of a chance to survive. 
trying to get a handle on why they're not surviving, increasing number of nest cameras are being, being put up. You can't do any management until you know what the problem is. There's no point just going out and doing all sorts of things, including controlling predators, unless you know it's a problem. This is a really ethical issue as well as, as everything else. So we have to know what's happening. So the more data we get, the better. And the data is starting to come in. So uh, nest cameras are really, really helpful. And if they show crows and foxes to be a problem, then predator management is carried out in some sites. But absolutely stress, it is only done if we know there's a problem, if it's, and it's targeted and it's small scale and it's localized. That's the way it is, otherwise we lose them. But that's, uh, that, is, that is the bald reality of conservation in Britain today. And it is a very difficult thing to talk about. It's a very painful thing to talk about. It's very uncomfortable. And it's um, an issue which I think we all have to be much more open about. There's a, there's a general impression among people who don't know much about conservation because they don't work in it. It's completely understandable that conservation is, is very sort of warm and fuzzy. It, it isn't a lot of it, it really isn't. Other ways to find, uh, understand what's happening to the birds is tagging them. Uh, Rachel Taylor from the BTO is doing wonderful work, trying to get us to understand how the birds are using the landscape in the breeding season, something we knew nothing about until this work was undertaken in 2016. And she is showing us just how far they travel. So they're just not going to their nest sites even when they're nesting, they're traveling long distances, 10 kilometers away feeding. And this is a bit of a worry because we may be double counting, we may be over counting the birds because we think the birds are coming back to nest in one area and they're bubbling away with that beautiful call. And then they're suddenly 10 kilometers away, bubbling again. And people think, ah, and that's a breeding bird. We don't know yet, but we may be over counting. So getting a handle on these birds. These birds which, which use landscapes, not just individual places, they use, they use whole landscapes all year round. It's going to be really difficult. So we can protect the nest site, but if their, their favorite feeding spot is not protected, it's being mown or drained or fertilized or whatever, lots and lots of stocking density on it, they're not going to be able to survive. So it's a very challenging bird. And one of the reasons I love them, but also uh, I'm so fascinated by them, is that they do concentrate so many of these huge issues 21st century Britain faces. This is a bird that, uh, just to make the point, it was tracked over 48 hours, so there the big cluster of, of on the top left is where its nest site was, so when the, the non-sitting bird was feeding all around the nest really, but at night the non-feeding bird went three kilometers away and nested by a little a little uh, tarn here and uh, some and in and I know the ones the new forest can go 10 kilometers they'll go from the new forest Myers and fly out to the coast at night which is fascinating so they're great travelers all over the place and Rachel's work is really showing how we have to think of these as landscape birds in the Seven and Avon Vales uh, we have lots of issues with uh, cutting silage, massive issues with cutting silage. Very willing farmers though, and the farmers really do want to protect them. The thing is they are so damn difficult to find when they're nesting. We also have a big issue in lots, and you do in the New Forest as well of course, with lots and lots of recreation, and uh, I'll come on to that in a minute with the New Forest work. But in the Seven and Avon Vales we've put signs up, please don't let your dogs run through these areas of meadows when there's nesting birds in there but also we're trying to find the nests with drones. When I say we, it's proverbial we, it's not me doing all this obviously, but the groups um, in the southern part of England. So these drones, putting thermal cameras on them, flying them over and to see if we can spot curly nests. Done at night, um, doesn't disturb the birds and um, it works. These were four, four nests that we knew existed in this great big meadow in, southern, in, in the Seven and Avon Vales. We flew a, a drone over and lo and behold, it detected the nests. So it's a really promising tool and a lot more of this is going to be tried this year. We had a bit of a hiatus last year because of all the, you know, the restrictions. But this year we hope to do a lot more and see if drone will help us. On to the new forest, 120 pairs you had in the 90s. Now you've only got 40. 
Um, and the biggest problems for the curlews in the new forest by far is predation and recreational disturbance. Don't have the silage cutting, of course, and the farming problems that, that have elsewhere. So most have four eggs and most fail within hours of being laid. Um, signs going up to try to keep uh, dogs on leads uh, in areas where the birds are nesting. Massive issue with that. And when you put signs up, it does help. And a lot of people do take notice. And I just think we need more of it and we need more education. And we need more people explaining. Um, you know, I've got a dog. I love taking my dog for walks in these lovely places where you go there because you like being there and the dogs like being there. But we have to, we live in a crowded world now and there are a lot of dogs. And we have to have a big conversation about how we look after dogs when there's nesting birds. The new forests have also been in great work with thermal uh, loggers. They put these in the nests and they track the temperature of the nest. And um, some really interesting results have come out of it. Other places do it as well. So this is a nest that's been successful. So once you put um, the, the um, temperature logger in and the bird sits, you can see that the day and night pattern of cold and warm starts to settle down. It's basically very level pattern. Um, the birds just is constantly warm in the nest. Then when they hatch, um, the birds get off the nest and you can see that the temperature logger goes back to day and night temperatures again. So that's a successful nest. This is an unsuccessful nest. It's being disturbed. We don't know what's disturbing it, but we do know that in the, in the, the, the night hours when it's not in daylight, so sometime evening, early morning in the night, it's off the nest, it's being disturbed, it's getting back on, it's getting off again, and then it uh, is predated. And probably at this time, if it's at this time in the morning, it might be a fox, but we don't know. We, we don't know. But it does give an indication of when predation is happening. And the more data we get like this, the better. So getting these little chicks to survive is not an easy task in modern Britain. They face massive issues. They face some of the biggest issues conservation has to come up against in the 21st century. So one of the things that we're doing, and this is actually uh, something that I suggested uh, few, two or three years ago and is now just about to come to fruition. It's an online Curlew Field Workers Toolkit. This is just a, an example of, uh, this is very much work in progress. So please don't, don't worry about what this is, just give you an example. But you'll be able to go online and you'll be able to download information, fact sheets, advice, the best advice possible, the best science out there from people who work in the field. If you just want to understand what calls you're hearing and what they mean, or if you want to get more stuck into the more technical side of field work and you're in a group, this will hopefully help. WWT work with me um, and now it's almost ready and it will go online um, on the Curlew Recovery Partnership website um, on like April the 21st. It won't be complete, but it's, we're getting there. We're getting there. And the other technique that is being employed with curlews, this is a last ditch measure, is head starting. WWT, that's Wild Fan and Wetland Trust in Slimbridge, um, is the pioneers and they, and they sort of do the gold standard head starting. And for those of you who don't know the term, eggs are taken out of the wild, they're raised in captivity, they, and they are hatched out in incubators, and then put into special pens where they're raised to fledging and then they are released into the wild. And the eggs that we got were taken off airfields. So the, the top left there is somebody collecting eggs off an airfield. And the reason we went to airfields is it was realized very recently that these military places where military do their training flights are very good places for curlews. Uh, but unfortunately they get under license or destroyed um, because they could be a danger to aircraft. And so once the army were, uh, sorry, the, the Air Force were approached and said, could we have, instead of destroying the nest, could we have the eggs? They were, could not have been more helpful. And um, they supplied, I'm sorry, press up my mistake. So they provided the eggs to be raised in captivity. And last year at Slimbridge, I think it was just about 60 birds were released, uh, not last year, the year before. And, uh, and and more birds are going to be taken this year. Not at Slimbridge. Slimbridge isn't head starting this year, but we're going to be doing a project down in Dartmoor. So there we are, head started birds from airfields 
and really, really helpful. Dartmoor has been chosen as the place to do some release this year because, let me give you a couple of gobsmacking statistics. Um, Dartmoor now used to have lots of curlews, you could imagine, an upland area, heathery, moorlandy, um, and was quite a hot spot. It has one breeding pair left, just one. So head starting, it's such desperate measures head starting, but working with the Duchy of Cornwall, identify the place to release the birds and they will be head started and released on Dartmoor this year. Um, other places could well do with it. There's five breeding pairs left in North Wiltshire, down from 19 pairs in this little patch of North Wiltshire. Um, it's got five pairs left and as far as we know, no breeding birds. Uh, in Rutland, they've produced one chick in 12 years. Um, in Dartmoor, actually three chicks in 20 years. So you begin to see the scale of the problem. I had the, sh the, the uh, bird report in from North Shropshire just last week, out of 100, 100 curlew nests in this large area of North Shropshire, only one nest produced chicks. So there's the breeding birds head starting, providing a bit of a ray of hope uh, and hopefully more head starting will be done. But I will stress this is not a silver bullet. It is a last ditch attempt to hold on to birds in very stressed environments. You can only do it if you're putting the habitat uh, back. You'll only be able to release these birds if they're going back into places where they have a fighting chance of surviving because it's immoral, it's unethical to release them into areas where they're not going to have any chance of surviving. But so far from the Slimbridge release birds last year, um, it's looking good. 30% have been recited, and that's about what you'd expect uh, from wild birds. So Slimbridge uh, from two years ago is beginning to look like it has succeeded, but we won't know more until later. There are the Slimbridge birds just about to be released out. And there they are. I just took a little bit of footage from a hide. Uh, there's a couple trying their wings out for the first time out there in the background, and one thinking, ooh, it's a bit muddy around here. Pouring with rain, but all those birds did eventually take off, and it was lovely to see them. So there we are. The curlews um, across Britain are struggling, there's no doubt. Uh, they, are, they are doing better in the uplands, but they're not doing brilliantly. And um, they, we think the population has gone right down, right across the board. So what do we do? We're doing everything we can. We're trying to raise awareness. Um, but I, I, I wonder if, if it's too late in some places. I, I wonder if we'll hold on to them in Southern Ireland, which is an, an appalling thing to say, but there's some very good people doing the best they can to try to hold on to them in Southern Ireland. Um, but going down to 135 pairs across the whole country in a, in a land which has immense environmental challenges. Um, well, we'll see. But the curlew is helping us to, to try to get a much greener Britain in the future. So I just needed to try and develop the course. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. That was uh, quite moving, I have to say. Um, a number of us in Hoss are really keen on the curlew. There are lots of people in on this meeting who've been involved in that survey work, either through Wild New Forest or Hoss. And we in Hoss have also funded a number of uh, satellite tags, and I'm sure we'll do more going forward. Um, several questions coming up, all with the same common theme. And, and one of those is, how is the curlew doing in Europe? Because I've, I've noticed there are places where they appear to be doing badly, like Sweden and Norway, and yet in Finland they claim they're doing okay. So what's the overall picture in, in, in Europe? It's quite, a, it's quite a, a sort of difficult one to get a handle on, and we do need another Europe-wide survey. They are doing appallingly in the Netherlands, appallingly because of the intensity of agriculture there. Um, not doing well in, in Norway and Sweden, and a lot of the birds we get coming back to Britain um, are those birds, and numbers are going down from those birds. Um, 
They are supposed to be doing quite well in Finland, um, although I'm not sure where that data, how that data has been achieved. So there is, an, there is certainly evidence that curlews are moving more north as climate change takes hold. So maybe we're seeing a shift in population. That could well be what's happening. Um, why they would do well in Finland and not anywhere else, I don't know. But everywhere across Europe, apart from Finland, and maybe some parts of these of the steppes of Russia, maybe, um, but things are going down. So a mixed picture, but it's certainly the losses in Britain are worse in the West. And that's a real worry because we have 35% of the world's breeding population of curlews. So, you know, we have a lot of curlews and we have an international responsibility to look after them. Yeah. Now, like somebody who's in hospital who's unwell, very often it's more than one illness at play that causes you to be, to be terribly ill. Climate change is there right across the board. So is it maybe the habitat destruction in Ireland and you, you mentioned the Netherlands, which have really caused the big, big decline there and they've, they've got many other problems to deal with at the same time already? Well, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, it's the change in land use, which has been the main driver of the decline. So the switch to this broad scale intensive agriculture, the switch to forestry has absolutely been devastating for ground nesting birds. Without a doubt, that's the case. So with the with the silage <clears throat> problem, uh, what is the solution there? Is that is that having people on the ground helping the, the farmers as we do, for example, here in Hampshire with stone curlews? Yes, it, it is. And I would, would not like to give the impression that the farmers that certainly that we've come across don't care. They do care, um, but they just in a bind because they need to get silage in to feed. The increasing the dairy and, and uh, meat production is increasing. We are demanding more milk, more dairy products, more meat. It's a real rise in it. And so we have to feed these animals through the winter. So the, the farmers have to feed their livestock. And so what do we do? I was in a meeting in uh, Wiltshire and uh, <clears throat> the, the farmers there, that silage is a big problem there. And uh, at the end of it, and there was actually an investment banker in the audience and he stood up and said, look, he said, um, if any of you farmers are out of pocket by the end of the year because you haven't been able to cut a field because of silage, um, because of the curlews, I'll underwrite your losses. And actually the farmer then stood up and said, actually, that's kind of you, but it's not your money we need, it's your silage. And so we have to find a way of getting the feed to the farmers. Compensation may work in some places, but maybe there's a way of, of, of distributing silage around the country. So if there's overproduction in one area where there aren't, there, there's not a big problem with ground nesting birds, maybe that can be redistributed. But all this is being looked at for the new ELMS, environmental land management schemes that are taking place. So the agri-environment schemes um, f uh, weren't working, the European ones weren't working, they were too broad scale, not nuanced enough. So we do have a chance to be a lot more targeted um, if we want to in, in the next few decades. The increase in predators in some areas obviously will have had an impact, but is there definitely evidence showing that the declines uh, are linked with an increase in predators or is it because in some areas presumably predators haven't increased? I wondered if the failure to succeed isn't bad there or you know, is it increasing? I think with, with everything it's, it's, it's so hard when you talk about this because people get very emotional about it and I do as well. It isn't just, it's nuanced. You can't say it's all predators, it's all land use. It, it varies and those two, those two things vary in importance depending where you are in the country. So in some places, and actually uh, Seven and Avon Vales is one, I don't think predation is a big, big issue at all, actually. It's much more to do with land use. Right. In other areas, in North Shropshire, I mentioned a hundred nests and only one fledged, undoubtedly, that is predators because there was no agricultural activity. They went too early. The, the nests were destroyed before any activity took place. Now, the other thing is that the, that area of North Shropshire is very near to very intensive pheasant shooting areas. And so if you're releasing 50 million game birds into the, into the countryside, is that keeping numbers of predators high? The science hasn't been done to definitively show that. You kind of think it's 
it might be obvious, but there are places where there's no pheasant shooting and we still have high numbers of predators. I wish I, I, wish I could give easy answers to this. Uh, I can't. All we can do is say almost nest by nest basis, what is going on here and what can we do? We're down to such low numbers in so many places, it almost is a nest by nest scenario. It's almost a bit like coronavirus because there are places in the UK where that sprung up and you can't see why why yeah. it did, there was no obvious link. Um, a question about rewilding from one person, lots of rewilding suggestions and talks going on, maybe not so much actually happening. Where do you see rewilding taking the curly? Yes, interesting and a really, really interesting question, this one. Um, I don't know because rewilding, I don't actually, to be quite honest with you, I don't actually know what it means. Does it mean letting, leaving land just to do what it wants to do? Or does it mean doing some light management like at NEP? Or does it mean we're going to do some management, but we're going to manage for the most biodiversity we can get? Um, up in Scotland, talking to somebody up there, a big conservation manager up there, he said, I don't like the term rewilding. I'd much rather call it rehabiting. I want to rehabit the landscape. Um, and that might mean I have to do some management and, you know, plant trees here or take them down or whatever, but I want the most number of species in, in the widest area possible. So rewilding is a term which I'm not trying to get out of answering the question, I just don't quite know what it means. If it means, it can't mean just letting the land go because we don't live in that, we're too crowded. Mm -hmm. We have to farm, we have to manage in certain areas. NEP is, 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 is still managed, you know, and so rewilding is a complex term. Rehabiting, I hope, will include curlews. I don't want to cover the country in curlews. <laughs> you know, I don't want them to, to sort of trump everything and everything's got to be about curlews. I want a big mix, rich mix, as much of, as everything as, as, it's, as it can in a really good balance, whatever that means and however we do it. So if rewilding means that, I'm right behind that. A couple of people are suggesting that, uh, you know, maybe this head starting plan is a good one. And that might be the answer. Do you, do you think that's likely? Head starting is a great plan if you've got the money and if you've got the management that has to imperatively go alongside it. You must not head start until you know that you're releasing those birds back into an environment where they're going to survive. It's, it's, it, it buys you time. Head starting doesn't solve a problem. It just buys you a bit more time, gives you a few more birds in the system while you're putting other things right. So it is a, a, an absolutely essential <clears throat> tool to get right, but it's very expensive, very expensive. Quite a few comments coming in about the situation in the new forest, in particular dogs and signs going up. Um, clearly the organizations who run the new forest <coughs> are trying uh, and signs have gone up in the last couple of weeks yeah. or so. People are saying though, not enough signs, maybe not, uh, not directive enough, more perhaps a bit too polite. What is your thinking about how you can handle something like a, a, a new forest with 15 million visitors a year? Oh, and growing because you've got this great development going on around the outside as well, haven't you? So Absolutely. there'll be more visitors and more residents and more dogs in the future. I think we just have to get people to come along with you. So I think putting up fences and saying, keep out and you know, you're not allowed here doesn't work. And uh, we all want to go there for the same reason, to enjoy being there. So we have to have a much better educated community. We have to tell people why this is so important. We have to get talk to people in a way that they feel involved in, in providing the solution and don't always feel part of the problem. Because people can feel very disempowered and very anti a project if they feel they're being kept out and they're not welcome. So I would much rather go, I, could, I agree, some signs could be, I'm sure could be a lot more targeted, but let people feel they're contributing rather than keeping people out. Well, it's been a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for that. We've been looking forward to it. We were really looking forward to it last year and we didn't get it and now we've got it. For those of you who haven't bought Mary's book, she's very conveniently helped me by putting it on the screen there. Curly Moon is a very nice read. It's, uh, it's a wonderful journey with her over that uh, the 500 miles around it. It's almost like you're with her all the way. So uh, thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts and good luck with what you're doing going forward. Thank you very much for having me.